feels it's all about to erupt. She opens her mouth and hand grenades come out. She wants to tear down the temple. Let's go for it. What the hell is she doing? Netflix drama The Crown has always pushed the button when it comes to blurring the line between fact and fiction. Fictionalization, that is. When you're dramatizing imagined conversations behind closed doors, it's bound to cause some hand wringing. While controversy has always dogged the Royal Series depiction of the Windsors, the fifth season has come under particularly fierce attack. A combination of timing so soon after Queen Elizabeth's death and the fact these episodes are set during the tumultuous early 1990s, the era of Charles and Diana's acrimonious and very public marriage breakdown, critiques of the show have escalated. So what's the deal? And is it a big deal? Is the crown a villain in the story of the British royals? Or is it just a bit of fun TV? I'm Bronte Coy and I'm a royal reporter. I'm Wenli Ma and I don't love the royals. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty, Wen. Always. <laughs> it has been by some margin, the worst year of my reign. Quite possibly my life. I'm happy for people to know. Well, as we mentioned, there's a few reasons why people are so upset about the crown, particularly at the moment. We've got to remember the Queen's death is still pretty fresh in people's minds. It's only been a couple of months. Britain especially was very much in mourning during that period. So for this show to come out and show the royals in a bit of a negative light, it's a little sensitive. The other issues that seem to be raised a lot at the moment are the fact that there are some storylines that every party involved has denied ever happened, which is fine for sort of smaller plot lines, but when it's something that can be really, really damaging, that's when people are getting upset. So for example, we have a scene in the later season of The Crown where Prince Charles approaches the then British Prime Minister, John Major, and tries to convince him to force the Queen to step down so Charles can take over. I'm saying what a pity it was. What a waste that his voice, his, his, his presence, his vision wasn't incorporated earlier. I think that the accusation that the then Prince Charles uh, collaborated with John Major to see if he could oust the Queen, utterly ridiculous. And you do actually have now got two living people who can refute that. The damage is that people believe it to be true and the Crown refuses to put in any form of a um, disclaimer at the beginning. They've been asked to do it and they won't. That's not very nice. That's quite damaging. That's pretty rude. That's his mum. Anyway, all parties, the John Major, the Palace, everyone involved has said that absolutely didn't happen. Another one, of course, is we've, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that Prince Philip's alleged affair with a close family friend plays out in this season. Penny is in the family, a married woman. Yes, and entirely focused on her marriage and her duty, who would never compromise you. Again, by all accounts, that didn't happen. So it's not a very nice story for Prince Philip. That's also a really boring plot line. I cannot stand any of the episodes where it's just royals loving horses. So, it's just like so boring. So that's its biggest crime. <laughs> it's also boring on it's screen. It's also boring. Uh, so you've got stories like that. And actually one from an early season is when the Queen goes to Aberfan. So this was a real disaster where more than 100 people died. It was an absolute tragedy. And in the show, the Queen admits to the fact that she was fake crying. Now, that goes to the very point of her humanity and the survivors that were there on the day in the real thing said that that is not an accurate portrayal of her when she turned up to the town. So this is why people are upset. And I gotta say, when you're talking about those specific elements, I do get it. I do understand that. I like that you brought up the word humanity because I think for me, the crown does something that the real royals don't do, which is they actually feel like they have humanity. We know from centuries of royal myth making that they're not allowed to show that they're actually humans, that they have feelings and emotions. So the characters, these fictionalized characters on screen, I feel like they can be vulnerable in a way that the real life royals can't and we can sort of relate to them, engage with them in a way that we can't with the real life people. So I feel like the fact that they are, they are flawed on screen is giving them a humanity that we don't otherwise see. And yes, I completely can see that a lot of those things sound very inaccurate, but they do A, make for good drama, B, it is a fictionalized story, and C, like, yes, some things are not accurate, but doesn't mean there's no truth to it either. There's a difference between accuracy and truth, like the stuff around Charles and John Major. The, the more important point of that plotline is that they're examining what is a modern monarchy. And I think that is a much more truthful and interesting question to ask than whether or not, you know, some of the conversations are accurate or not. Of course, that is a fair question to ask, but in this way, <laughs> literally seeing her son sit down and say, hey, do I want to get rid of the old bag? 
That's pretty That gross. makes it more interesting. And she just <laughs> passed away. So I definitely understand the criticism on that one. I think especially anything that's happening in this latest season that is um, related to the Queen and her legacy is going to be extremely sensitive. And that is something you've got to consider. There is a family at the centre of it. There is a family at the centre of it, but how real are these people at this <laughs> point? That's a whole different argument. Right? That's true. That's true. What do you imagine I say? Oh, Lord, yes. That is awful, a nightmare. What a mistake that was. So a lot of the criticisms have been around the fact that the Netflix show does not make explicit that it is a dramatization, that it is a fictionalization. And what you've had are a lot of people calling for every episode to be preceded with a line that says this basically didn't happen. It's just sort of inspired by real life events, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Among the people who've asked for this is Judy Dench of all people. Uh, she's apparently really good friends with Camilla. So that explains a few things. Look, I actually think a fictionalization disclaimer isn't necessarily necessary at this point because we're five seasons in I feel like audiences know what the crown is about and I also think we often don't give audiences enough credit to make those judgments on their own I mean do I spend my time watching the crown and googling whether or not something happened yes yes I do but that's what google's for <laughs> first of all what Dave and Judy don't ask for well, you do uh, <laughs> secondly with the fictionalization disclaimer I do think that's completely relevant because we see this with a lot with like po serialized podcasts and, and TV shows and all that. They're always, you know, there's inspired by real events. The problem is when you mix in 95% of truth with just 5% of a completely fabricated thing, it's all very believable. I'm not sitting there fact checking everything. I'm a royal reporter and I've read about most of these events and I still find myself getting sucked in and I'm like, wow, I can't believe he said that. It's so spicy. <laughs> Which is interesting and probably speaks to me. But the point that I'm making is with this show, there is a difference between having conversations being fictionalized for the sake of the story coming to screen, which I completely understand. We see it in everything. We've done that TV shows, movies, it always happens. But when it's something that, to go to my earlier point, goes to the very heart of someone's humanity, their legacy, if it is completely against what people have said actually happened in that event, then I think that's when it kind of goes a bit too far. In, in this case, I'm talking about the things like the Charles trying to mm. oust his mother, um, the Abba fan, her pretending to cry and not caring. Like that's, that's a very serious allegation. I mean, it, it, it is a serious allegation, but do you, don't you think most audiences will be like, maybe this happened, maybe this didn't happen? I don't know that people kind of just watch it and go, this is 100% fact, it's a documentary. And we know that even documentaries aren't 100% factual because it's all about what you choose to include and don't. It's really a compliment to the crown that I think that they're this, they have this responsibility because you watch it and I find that you do get fully sucked into the story. It is hard to separate it, the fact from fiction. So That's true, but I also think that is probably the case with royals in general. We only have ever known what they want us to know about them. They are better curators of their version of the truth, better than anyone else. That is true. We have to agree on that. <laughs> we do. We are a normal family, you know. I love my children the same way any father does, and I hope George loves me the same way any son does to his father. The Crown has undoubtedly put the royals more on the map with a whole new generation of people than it ever would have before. We've seen a lot of the younger generation is more engaged with the monarchy, and they have been since the Crown came mm. out. Um, whether or not they like them or approve of them or are Republicans, uh, they are definitely more interested in the royals. So. That's a positive. After the Queen died, the Crown also moved back into Netflix's top 10. And that, again, just proves the point that it's it's working to feed into their PR machine. However, I think that when the Queen was in power, she had 70 years behind her and people on the whole, more broadly, respected her a lot and she was a lot more popular than Charles will ever be. I think it worked for her. I think the issue we're gonna find now, particularly with the storylines that are literally playing out on the show now, it's very badly timed for Charles because he doesn't come across very well. And he's now the king. And his number one job is keeping the monarchy together and proving to people that he is likable and dependable and, can, and, and that they'll just like him, they'll respect him. I'm not sure that Tampon Gate, the Camilla affair, the die years? I don't know that this is exactly the right storyline for him right now. It's bad timing for him. It's not great. Although those things actually did happen. With the, that oh, is not in dispute. So Charles can't really run away from the history of his life because that played out so publicly at the time yep. that we, you know, it's in recent living memory, the, the stuff that he uh, is accused of. Oh God, I just live inside your trousers or something. It would be much easier. What are you going to do, turn into a pair of nickels? Oh, God forbid, a Tampax. Just my luck. Oh. <laughs> you are a complete idiot.
But I actually think The Crown did a really good job over the four previous seasons and this current season. Um, again, about hu humanising these people that are often just seen as symbols, that are often seen as just ribbon cutters. Um, what it kind of does though is actually it gave me, someone who is neither a monarchist nor a royalist, a much deeper appreciation for this idea of duty and sacrifice. Yeah. I never thought about it very deeply and then having it sort of play out in these fictionalised storylines over all these years, I've gone, wow, the Queen really actually did do a lot because from the outside, if you're not that interested in the royals, you just go, well, they turn up to some some events, they have cups of tea and, you know, wear sparkly dresses and pillbox hats. So to get a much deeper idea of what their contributions are to British cultural soft power, I think is really where the crowd has benefited the royals, especially in countries beyond the Commonwealth, because we're very used to them. Mm. Like the Americans would probably have a much better idea now of what the British royals entail. And I mean, let's face it, I think we both agree that they are a huge economic boon to the UK. Oh, absolutely. It gives them this sort of veil of cultural relevance that may not actually be true for a dying empire, a dying yep. imperial power, who um, like look at the last few weeks of what's going on with their government. They it don't, makes them yeah. interesting as well. And Charles and Diana, they kept things real interesting. So thanks Saucy. for that. The Queen and Philip and people mm. like the sort of the outer wings there, they don't seem that interesting. You watch the show and all of a sudden you're like, Princess Margaret. She's really cool. I'd like oh, to know more about her. She is great. Things like that. So definitely I think I agree with everything you've just said. I do think that it's really helped them in the past. I definitely think it's not going to help Charles specifically moving forward here. But we'll see how much of out. his 30 years of rehabilitation have actually worked. <laughs> we'll see. We will. The royal family is in genuine crisis. How did it come to this?